Hello everyone and welcome to my legendary starter guide for the Bretonians. Bretonia as the main faction itself is probably the hardest campaign out of all three Bretonian factions. Bretonia is situated way on the north side of the Bretonians and uh, unfortunately they start at war with three factions the Skaligs, the Skull Smashers, and Marienburg. This guide will focus and give you the details and how to ha have a successful starting campaign and then you can build your empire in whichever direction you want. King of Bretonia. With your main faction leader he will be he, essentially part of your doom stack and you'll be utilizing his elite cavalry and the artillery pieces to help ensure yourself victory. Being able to buy the knights with a discount and being able to build grail knights those are more late game items. The movement speed will be a bonus and the aura size is just fine. I mean you'll need it for an upcoming massive battle that you're gonna have. The elite units will be very important for a massive stack battle that will be at the end of turn 5. Now I'm just gonna do a quick glance at showing of wh where we're we going or how is the strategy gonna be done. Effectively, what we're doing is a Blitzkrieg type of strategy in quickly attacking our enemies before they're able to build up. Don't worry about moving into the regions of your Bretonian brothers. They'll never declare war on you, and honestly, it's not worth the dishonor. You have to deal with the Skull Smashers and Marienburg, but primarily we will focus on dealing with Marienburg. Once those two enemies are wiped out, we then need to prepare our coastal defenses for the Skalig invasion. The Norsekin tribes will continuously send like stacks three to four onto your shores, so we need to get ready for that. But first, we need to deal with our Blitzkrieg rush. With your king, set him, put him on the border, and then select two men at arms and two bowmen. Create a balance between archers and melee. With legendary difficulty, your troops are not that powerful, but rely on your archer units, because your archer units are what's going to actually break the morale of your enemies and shatter them. In your capital, uh, set the, uh, the edict which gives you extra recruitment and a slight discount. From here on, you will build a second lord. Now, economically speaking, this isn't exactly the most viable strat, but don't worry, trust on me this. You will need you need that lord so you can build a reinforcement army for an upcoming massive battle you'll have later on. With your Bretonian brothers, you can try and do some trade agreements with them. Some of them you can get a trade agreement early on, some you can't, but at the very least, get a non-aggression pact with all of your Bretonian brothers. This improves your diplomatic relationships on legendary difficulty so eventually they'll start accepting your trade agreements because right off the bat they don't like you. More, more in part it's because of legendary but start with non-aggressions and then you can work your way up in getting trade agreements. With the Empire, Emperor Karl Franz, stay neutral with them and don't even bother trying to attack them. You're gonna have plenty to do and plenty to kill on this coastline. You're gonna have to deal with these two factions, the Mussolini vampires and the Wood Elves before they become a, super, a world superpower. As we move on with our next turn, I'm just trying to make everything go a little bit quicker here. Everything seems to be going good. Marienburg and the Skull Smashers are building up their doom stacks. And with our king and his main army, we will choose to attack Marienburg. Now, the reason we're doing this is to stop our enemies from actually building up their stacks. With our secondary army, we'll get ready to build troops there. You can rush either the Skull Smashers or Marienburg, but Marienburg is a much better finite, well, economic target to go after. Now, though the uh, auto balance is against us, 
We'll just stay, we'll siege him for one turn and build up our troops. Three men at arms and three bowmen. Build men at arms. Do not choose spearmen. Because if you choose spearmen, you, the, vic the automatic victory will be either a loss or a ferric victory. With your agent, there is something you can do with the agent to actually cause some significant damage to that Skull Smash army. Assassinating the faction leader. If you kill the Orc War Boss, there's a chance that you might get like a Night Goblin or a Shaman. Unfortunately, I wasn't that lucky this round, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But either way, there is going to be a massive battle against that Skull Smasher army to prevent them from becoming an actual power. So we can then focus on our economics rather than spending money on troops to continuously fight these orc tribes. Not to mention the Skalig. And the Skalig Norskins are preparing their doom stacks to come down towards us, so this has to be a quick Blitzkrieg battle. Our secondary army has built up its troops, and then we can move them into reinforcement range. <clears throat> From here, you have a more than, it's a 60 to 40 chance of victory. If you auto this battle, it's always a guaranteed close victory. You'll never lose. Securing Marienburg is huge. Because if you let them live, they could build like two to three doom stacks, and honestly, it's not even worth fighting. It's a very they're a very difficult Empire of Factions are very difficult due to the fanatic unit they have that doesn't break morale. Not to mention the Bretonian infantry aren't exactly that great. From here, I'm just combining my troops uh, so to make the replenishment rate go faster due to me being over the citizen limit. There is... S S Marienburg is still alive, though. Since we took their capital, they want peace more than anything. We are going to use these funds to, to further proceed our campaign against the Skull Smashers. Now, the most money you can get through a peace agreement with Marienburg at this stage is 4,700 gold. Unfortunately, that really depends on the RNG of your campaign. Sometimes you might have to go down to like 4,200 to 4,700. That's basically the price range. Sometimes they might go very low with you, and sometimes they might accept a high deal. It really just depends on your campaign. In this particular campaign, I was I was experimenting for quite a bit, <laughs> try to get some odd numbers or try to get it like throw in there to make them convince them to get the deal. Getting as much money is essential. Now you could take this money and basically build up your capital, but honestly, what we're going to be doing with this money is build a third army to reinforce us in the battle against the Skull Smashers. We're going to need as many troops and as many, well, yeah, as many troops as possible to actually win this upcoming battle. Overall, it's the battle that decides your campaign. 4,200 was enough to convince Marienburg for a peace treaty, and now I don't have to worry about them anymore. Back in my main capital, I could build a new lord and build a new army. A third. Though, economically speaking, I'm not planning to, to keep this army for a while, but it'll be enough. With the priestess, since she failed the first time in assassinating, the chances in trying to assassinate again are extremely low. So, it's either the first time it works or it doesn't. At this point, uh, I just need her to get some levels, and maybe I can use her in battle. Now, the reasoning I'm sending my king to actually siege that city is to stop the Greenskins from actually building up their troops. Now, you're probably wondering, thinking, wait, but then the Greenskins will attack the king and kill him. Here's the funny thing. 
The Greenskins never chase your king when they're in that city. They're too busy building up their doom stack to actually leave and actually chase after you. So, you can take advantage of it. With your third army, continue building three men-at-arms, three archers, and you're good. With your main army, you'll fall back, and you essentially just delayed the Greenskins from actually building up their stack. This is the position you want to be in. Now, will it be a difficult battle? Of course. On legendary difficulty with the penalties of leadership against all these orc boys, it's gonna be it's gonna be a challenge, and I'll be going over through this critical battle with you guys step by step. I've won this battle four times. Three close victories and one fair victory. So I'll go into detail and everything. I sent that reinforcement army into the castle just so they can replenish a little more. Now I'll try to put as many troops I can into the main army before this whole battle starts. And then I'll come then I'll bring them in as reinforcements to support me in this massive battle. The reason the Greenskins have such a huge advantage is because they start with a defensive building, which gives them orc archers, goblin wolves, and uh, I believe, and two more orc boys, yeah. It is a massive battle, but it can be won, even with it being legendary, and even though you have much weaker soldiers, you can win. And we'll be going through that right now. At the start of the battle, you need to start it and put, try to put your your trebuchet's artillery as far back as you could possibly can. You'll need that because you don't want the greenskins to attack you immediately. When your artillery is in range, it actually convinces the enemy's AI to just go on a full-on berserker charge to get to, uh, well, so they don't have to deal with your artillery and get damaged. Keep your artillery for as far back as possible. You're going to be creating a line of both infantry and then archers in behind. You will separate your cavalry units by twos. Two cavalry on your right, two cavalry on your left. Keep your best cav on the left, though. The knights, the knights of the realm, and the grail knights. And give them, and those elite knights, give them a detachment of three archers. You're going to use those archers to basically pepper the side, the left flank of the orcs. Once they do that full-on berserker charge. Your artillery will be used to hammer the uh, center line of the greenskins. So you can, like, cause some massive morale damage. And just damn heavy damage overall in their center line while you'll be using your right flank knights to deal with archers or maybe even crash, like hook around and hit the center line. Your Pegasus knights? Send them to the far right into that forest and get ready to move them. That unit will be utilized to attack the enemy's artillery. The enemy has one artillery unit and it's here in your best interest to get rid of that artillery unit as soon as possible. If that artillery unit starts firing at your line, it does a minus 10 morale debuff. So it is utterly devastating. So, keep in mind on that. This is going to be a massive battle. Now if you're playing on legendary difficulty, you will definitely know that you can't pause the battle. But uh, if you play on lower difficulties, let's say like very hard or any lower difficulties, you can pause the battle and give orders to your troops while you pause the game. But on Legendary, uh, it just isn't an option. It will take you a little bit of time to organize your troops, so do keep that in mind. The reasoning we have these two extra lords is exactly what you may think it is. One lord will be covering the morale bonus on the left flank, and one lord will be covering the morale bonus on the right flank. This is going to be a massive battle. And your archers, and what's expected to happen is that your center line is going to get crushed. The orc boys are essentially just have better stats than 
men at arms. And what we're counting on heavily is the archers to basically, when a gap is opened, your archers will focus on doing as much damage to that gap and will cause a significant amount of damage to the greenskins. At the very start of the battle, the greenskins will do a full on charge and they will start flanking with their uh, wolf riders as soon as possible. With your melee units, your men at arms, make sure to charge the enemy's orcs. Do not just keep them in a standing formation. Like, basically in a defense formation. Because if they stand, they'll have to absorb that big charge attack from the greenskins, and it's going to be devastating. They're actually going to falter much faster than them actually charging the enemy in return. You might think, well, may maybe you should have built spearmen. Unfortunately, the spearmen just have slightly better defense, but um, overall their stats are much weaker. There are, you, you want as much attack as possible for your units. Once you start moving up this artillery, it could trigger it could trigger the greenskins at any time. Moving your Pegasus Knights even closer will also trigger it. Keep the peasants. The peasants are honestly kind of useless in this battle, but I just keep them on the side in case, uh, in case I need to catch the Goblin Wharf Riders. Stats-wise, you want your men at arms to charge the enemy's units, so basically it's a battle between charge bonuses. Your men will actually take a little less damage. They'll still lose, but uh, they won't take a full, like a full-on loss. Now with these Pegasus Knights, I'm trying to get a little closer to the enemy. It actually could trigger the enemy to actually do a full-scale attack. As for this special group, this I'll call like a special task force, this left flank group will be responsible for breaking the left line and then doing as much damage as possible. There's enemy movement, something's, something's going on with the AI, they are moving up. You go immediately see that both the left flank and the right flank, they're moving up their goblin wolf riders. This should be no problem for your elite cavalry. Your knights, your knights errant, shit, just select the charge stance, and it'll be a very easy slaughter. So don't even, no need to worry about the wolf riders. However, once the enemy starts getting close, get ready to do a full scale assault. I saw the artillery firing automatically as shooting at the, at the wolf riders. I'm changing their priority aiming to hit the center line. <clears throat> if you can break the center line of this green skin army, you can win this battle. Now will you suffer heavy losses? I've yet to play this battle and not have and not suffer losses. The enemy simply just has better stats. And men at arms, like early game Bretonian men at arms, are just not that powerful. Here I'm just trying to put uh, King Leoncourt in the center line, just to make sure. I gotta be very careful that archers don't hit the Pegasus Knights. Okay, Wolf Riders are close enough, send both Cav units to charge them. Those archer units actually did a little bit of damage to that wolf unit, so it's an easy victory. With the Pegasus Knights, quickly hook around and attack that Doom Diver catapult. Now, I can't, do not ignore your cavalry here, because they're going to send their archers on their flanks to hit the cav. If you don't move your cav, they're going to get hit and you're going to take some losses, unfortunately. This is why I have these archers quickly return fire. Now a full scale line battle is about to happen. I'm selecting all my melee units and I'm only right clicking the enemy once so they're walking towards the enemy. But notice that I have them in a control group. <laughs> this is a legendary strat. I mean, if, you, if you're not playing legendary, don't worry. Now I select uh, one and then I hit the R button. So immediately all units start running in a sync 
sync to matter. With my elite units, I'm setting them to flank around and get ready to hit the rear of these units. There's a lot of micro involved here. Your archer units will be dealing with their archer units, and your kev units huck around and do as much damage as possible. Make sure to not give the enemy any chance to use their archers against your horses. The middle line's already faltering. That's fine. It's expect it's going to happen. Your middle line is just not strong enough to take on orc boys. You're hope you're hoping that you can break their flanks and cause a mass rally. The orcs will continue pushing and they'll head hit the catapults and trebuchets. With your Pegasus Knights, use them to reinforce Whichever flank needs it most. Now, keep in mind about legendary mode. Even though you you could break a unit and make them rout, very often they're going to come back. This is why it's good to have these archers. to basically shoot the volleys at enemies that are coming back, that recover. Because, they rec because the difficulty on legendary, they'll be able to recover it uh, quite often. These three archers are extremely useful. Once they kill off the, the soldiers that were routing, you can then just continue on. There's a l great deal of micro involved in this battle. So, if you play a co-op campaign, it could be a lot easier if you have a friend to help you, help you out in this regard. Both the left and my left and right flank are doing extremely well. My center flank has actually been destroyed, but that's honestly fine. I'm relying on these archers to do plenty of damage. I have a lot of units standing on the side. Basically have them target center blob. I totally forgot I had the, uh, the mage, but there is just... Yeah, there's a there's a lot of things to micro for a battle like this, and a victory is achieved. Since I was able to both crush their left flank and their right flank heavily, their center their center flank just routed. The center flank sustained a, an immense amount of damage due to the artillery, and since they are, their morale is already low. And you crush their left flank and their right flank, that will cause a mass panic and essentially make the Green Skin Army retreat. That is effectively what this strategy is based behind. And effectively, once you win this battle, you have a much more relaxing campaign as Britonia. I'll be going over a couple steps and I'll in a couple more strats. And where you can go from here. Essentially, after this battle, you can then focus on your economics in your main province and dealing with rebellions. The rubble, dealing with the rebel armies, is not going to be difficult. We'll be covering it right now. When you achieve victory against both the both Berenberg and the Skull Smashers, you basically ensure yourself a great deal of peace. You raise it to the ground. And you're doing good. I got lucky with the blessing, the lady, but it's not guaranteed. It's not a guarantee you'll get. You have plenty of battles to get the blessing of the lady. And now, at this stage, we effectively have peace on the mainland. The Norskin tribes are still going to be coming for us, and trying to send an army up there at them right off the bat in the early game is not worth it. The Norskins. They build, they send generally stacks of two, three to four stacks at a time to attack your coastline. And right now, with my main army, I'm going to have to deal with two rebellions, both at my capital and Marienburg. Now, with the remnants of your army, basically combine what units you have and basically send them to your main stack. So... 
you don't have to so you can deal with the whole peasant economy situation combine your your units and disband the units that are pretty worthless like spearmen or peasants the only reason you kept them is for the uh the uh the skull smasher battle once that's over you can start combining and disbanding these lords and then bring them whenever they're required yes you can focus basically your economy at this stage to have more economics or have a strong military. Just continuing to combine the troops together and we'll be more than ready to move out. I was a little confused there for a second why it didn't work. But uh, this is a good standing army. I lost a knight's Lord errand in the battle, Antonia. but uh, unfortunately, Knights. some losses can't happen. If you lose your Grail Knights or Pegasus Knights, or you lose way too many Knights, I would honestly suggest you restarting because it's going to be a while before you can get uh, those type of, of powerful Knights again. They're definitely not worth losing. Do keep an eye on it. The leadership buff was... With this campaign in general, you'll be focusing both on leadership and the campaign skills. With your agent, focus on the campaign skills, so basically you give a discount for your buildings. Already we're already getting a positive income thanks to acquiring the Marienburg port. And from there we could get, just focus on our economics to build up our provinces. A rebellion has spawned in our capital, but that is not a problem. Essentially, just send your army back to the capital, enforce march stance, and um, they can start replenishing even more. With this uh, rebel army, you want them to attack the castle. You want them to grow. The more they grow, the more experience you'll get, the more gold you get, and. Uh, your stack plus the defense, the garrison units, gives you adva an advantage over the Greenskin Rebellion. So you're guaranteed to win. With the tree, I just got a little bit of the economics right off the bat, and now I'm going to focus on more the military side so I can get uh, better di diplomatic relationships with my Bretonian brothers. Right after we finish off with this Greenskin Rebellion, You'll be sending your um, Bretonian Doomstack back to Marienburg to deal with those rebels. Now, unfortunately, there are many issues that can happen here, like chaos. Beastmen can be roaming in the area, and they can cause some issues. Don't worry about it too much. Essentially, from this uh, this in this playthrough, you're gonna have to keep build a second army and station it in Mar in Marienburg just to deal with all the Norskin doomstacks coming from the uh, north. <clears throat> Don't worry too much about this rebellion. It'll take them about three, three, four turns before they grow their army and they siege your castle. You could just simply wait. I didn't want to since I'm going to auto this battle, I didn't want to do it until my second artillery unit has a bit more health. Could you attack that uh, greenskin army? Yeah, you could, but honestly, you're better off waiting and letting the having the garrison units as reinforcements. It gives you a big advantage. King Louis. But particularly, I must say that, uh, in all honesty, the hardest part of this campaign is essentially bearing perk and skull smashers. Eventually, you'll be working your way down southward towards the, uh, the Wood Elves. And dealing with them as soon as possible is a good strategy. Because if you leave them alone, they might be this isolationist type of faction at the start and in, and in the mid game. But then they turn into a superpower, and they just steamroll everything. So, this is wrong. trying to deal with them should be a priority. That rebel army should be attacking the uh, the capital here in a moment. 
Just let the turn finish. And there we go. They're sieging the capital. Take your doom stack and attack. And it's not even fair. 80 to, 80 to 20. Auto. So you basically just auto it. Decisive victory. You get yourself a nice, uh, what? You get plenty of, pl a bit of gold. Sure, you're not going to ransom the targets because you don't want to lose honor. And essentially, just execute the victims, gain the honor, and you're good to go. Who calls? With uh, King Leoncore, I'm essentially going to be focusing down on the leadership tree right off the bat. If you're going down campaign skills, go for a lightning strike as soon as possible. You're going to need it if you're going to be fighting the Warriors of Chaos and the Norskin tribes. The Norskin tribes Scalic, they generally only roam around in stacks of two to three. And they're always going to be in reinforcement range of each other because generally their armies are very weak. They rely solely on numbers, massive numbers to overwhelm their enemies. And with Lightning Strike, you essentially counter that uh, ability. You seek counsel? With your main stack, chase after the Rebellion, and you'll have an easy victory. After you complete your victory against the, uh, the Rebellion, the Orcs, you can then send your stack to deal with the Rebellion that's growing in Marienburg. You garrison inside the castle and deal and wait for the army to attack. Just keep in mind the garrison in Marienburg is not as strong as the garrison that is situated at your capital. The reason I got the Crown of Bretonia is just so for the extra morale bonus for all my units. And um, I'm not building up my cities until the damsel is in the area. That was a bit of a mistake that I didn't deploy the damsel in that turn, but eh, it's fine. It's it's no big deal. I'll deploy her essentially next turn and then essentially uh, cover the mistakes in that regard. From here on, we'll continue on with the turns and essentially deal with the rebellion. Now, I'm not too concerned. I could you, you could probably go into Marienburg and wait for the full-on attack, but uh, just as a precaution, I'd rather attack them right off the bat. I will lose these men at arms since they're like half health. You could probably play this battle and get be much better results, but this was just for quick results for the starting, just for a guide, like for this to be done very quickly. Finish off these armies. There's also another great thing that's being showcased here. Since you're getting all these decisive victories, you're getting a lot of free honor. And uh, with this region in general, you could essentially take advantage of these rebellions and essentially just farm these rebels and just continuously obtaining honor and improving the economy of your region. Through your research at this point, you have a strong base to start from here. You can essentially build up economically both your main capital, the small village to the side, and Marienburg, and just build up this economic powerhouse. But do keep in mind to keep an army in Marienburg. If you don't, you're going to have trouble dealing with the Norskin factions that are coming in from the north. This ultimately covers the legendary starter guide for the, the Bretonian faction. I'll skip ahead and give you guys a little bit of advice and some tips on what to do for your mid game or late game. Essentially areas that you will focus on your economics and areas to focus on building up your military forces. Because it's almost tempting to build a infantry type of production area and your main capital do do starting with barracks but actually it's not you're better off ha using the uh your main capital as a area to build more heavy knights like grail knights or hippogriff knights rather than just foot squires or archers 
Archers and uh, spearmen will be situated at Castle Artosis, and we'll, you'll see that here right in a second. In this campaign, I was essentially playing as Bretonia, and I chose the option to do the final battle against the Chaos, the forces of Chaos. And quite honestly, that was much more difficult than it should have been. I then played against the Greenskins in a different campaign, and the final battle was much easier and a lot easier to reach. Because with the uh, with Bretonia, you have to go through a lot of chaos territory, and you got to deal with the Scaligs and the Varg. This it might look a little bad <laughs> with uh, how these Doom stacks are in Bretonia, but honestly, this isn't a problem. I essentially could build my own stacks in a short amount of time. Marienburg more than likely is going to fall due to how many stacks are surrounding it. However, however, I have a decent number of uh, two stacks in my capital, and my capital is like tier five, so technically it's like four stacks, three stacks, strength-wise. This castle is extremely important for your for your troop production. You'll be using this to build up your spearmen, your pole arms, and your archers. This woodworker shop is critical. Not only does it make cheaper units, but it makes units uh, at a triple rank right off the bat. I built up a a lord, and uh, thanks to all the research and technology, I can essentially build like almost like half a stack in one turn. So two, give me two turns, and I can have a full stack of peasants ready to go out into a battle. I would build peasants in this province, like archers, spearmen, then move into my main capital region purchase the knights, and I have that stack ready to go off anywhere that needs to be reinforced. And this is essentially my playthrough. With the uh, capital though, I would change one thing. I would get rid of the tavern. Most In most legendary campaigns, you want a public order building to improve the, uh, the region, but honestly with Bretonia, just stick to the edict, and then just get more trade buildings so you can actually get a little bit more income with the factions you'll be trading with. And then just focus on the epic buildings, build up your stables to the highest tier so you could get the Royal Hippogriff Knights. If you're fighting Chaos, you're gonna need those Hippogriff Knights just due to the armor piercing values. If I was to choose between attacking the Greenskins or attacking the Chaos in, like, in the final battle, in all honesty, I'd choose Greenskins. They the thing is that when you're going up against all four legendary lords of the Chaos Knights, they're, I mean, they have extremely heavy armor, and the Bretonians don't exactly have a lot of armor-piercing values. I had a, I had six, no, not six, I think I had eight Grail Knights in that army, and they all died. Due to simply, like, they're not having strong enough AP values. But my foot squires and my hippogriff knights did plenty of work. But honestly, the battle was a, was a bit close. If you guys are interested in the battle, I could do it in, in another video. But for now, to keep this video short, I'll be more than likely be ending it here. You can also see <laughs> the expedition I did into the Wood Elves. Uh, this was back when the Wood Elves were already like making confederations and they were already too strong. And honestly, I had three stacks go into that area, and they suffered heavy attrition and heavy damage. Essentially, my stacks were destroyed. But they were able to cause enough damage to basically stop the Wood Elves from expanding from there. I didn't bother to destroy the Oak of Ages. I mean, it doesn't produce units, so it's completely fine. Once you raise down the Wood Elf villages, they don't come back. But, uh, yeah... I do hope that this guide was helpful for you guys. A quick uh, browse through the tree of my leader, and and that is all. I hope you guys enjoy the guide, and I'll see you next time.